Welcome to the Chicago Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection webinar. Please note any website or email that I mentioned will be posted in the chat. For those seeking business license assistance, you can visit us here at City Hall in the Small Business Center or call 312-74-GO-BIS. Also, business license can be applied for or renewed online at chicagobusinessdirect.org. If you are a part of the BACP Entrepreneur Certificate Program, you can get credit for joining this webinar by sending an email to BACP Outreach at cityofchicago.org. To learn more about this program, please visit chicago.gov forward slash business education. This webinar is being recorded and will be available at youtube.com forward slash Chicago BACP. We would like to encourage all attendees to ask questions. Please use the chat box and send your questions, or you can raise your hand and we can unmute you, and there will be a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. At this time, I will now turn this webinar over to Dr. Awadri for us to begin. All right, thank you so much. Appreciate everybody joining. Uh, I'm Allison Arwady. I'm the commissioner at the Chicago Department of Public Health. And I wanna extend my thanks to BACP for inviting us to do a briefing for you all on CARE. CARE is the Crisis Assistance Response and Engagement Program. It's basically an alternate 911 where we are embedding mental health professionals into 911 response. And we know uh, that businesses often are um, having needs around clients uh, and others who may have acute mental health needs and wanted to make sure you knew about this program and we could get your questions answered. So if you could move to the next slide. Um, just I wanted to put this in the context of some of the real growth that we've been doing in Chicago around no barrier mental health service access. So if you look back uh, at 2019, the city of Chicago was putting about $12 million into mental health resource resources. We served about 3,600 people that year, um, and none of those were children. So that is important, but it is nowhere near where we need to be for a city of our size. And so you can see that even throughout COVID, um, we've really been appreciative of having many more investments um, from Mayor Lightfoot and City Council, where we the investments that the city is making in mental health have gone from 12 million in 2019, you can see uh, last year up to $89 million persons served have gone from about 3,600 all the way up to almost 74,000 individuals. And we went from no children to about 14,000 children. This, this is all related to especially outpatient mental health services. Next slide. And um, this is part of uh, the framework that we've been working on for the last four years it was a, a, a task force um, that came together, really gave recommendations to the city around mental health equity. And you can see that um, there were four main things that we were charged to work on and have been working on. Uh, the goal overall is just to strengthen Chicago's mental health safety net system to ensure that all Chicagoans can receive care when and where they need it regardless of their ability to pay their immigration status or their health insurance. And so those four pillars are, the first is about expanding publicly funded outpatient mental health services. The second is more around um, people impacted by violence and making sure they're getting services. The third is about expanding crisis prevention and response programs for people living with serious mental illness, as well as what we call co-occurring disorders, people who have both mental illness and substance use needs. And then the fourth is facilitating systems coordination. So just briefly on that top one, expanding publicly funded outpatient mental health services, the center of this is what we call our trauma-informed centers of care network. So I'm happy to say that there are now 177 clinical sites across hashtag all 77 of Chicago's neighborhoods um, that have gotten city funding to be able to hire mental health clinical staff and be able to expand care in a way that is no barrier. So uh, free of charge for folks who are, you know, uninsured, lower income, um, able to, you know, you don't need to have a particular immigration status, a health insurance status, an ability to pay. And all of these sites provide mental health care that is first trauma-informed. And I know you may or may not know what that term means, but in, in our care program, we also think about being trauma-informed. It's really about trying to change the conversation broadly from a what's wrong with you uh, to a what happened to you? How do we focus on long-term healing, uh, reducing stigma, um, not re-traumatizing people? 
It's also meant to be integrative. It's about letting Chicagoans get high quality mental health care in their neighborhood in trusted settings that they choose. So we've embedded mental health professionals into regular doctor's offices, like federally qualified health centers. Uh, we put more into dedicated mental health clinics, including the five that the city uh, is pleased to continue to be operating and growing. Um, but then we've also put some mental health providers in less traditional settings, like food pantries and libraries. Um, and we've also required that all of our all of the sites in our network are thinking about not just the mental health, but the physical health for all patients. So if you move on, um, in 2019, this is what this looked like on the left. Those 3,600 patients or so um, were served across uh, mental health service locations in blue there. That's a combination of uh, the five city clinics as well as um, some other partner organizations. And you can see on the right, we're up to those 74,000 patients served across all of these locations across Chicago. It's been a huge investment, um, but it really has built the safety net outpatient structure for the city. We hope to continue growing this, um, but this is the backbone on which care then, which is the more emergency response portion uh, where we're also thinking about how do we respond to mental health emergencies is kind of built on top of this. So if you move ahead, um, and yeah, this is just a little more of the details there. Um, and oh, yeah, just mentioning there, those 177 clinical sites, that doesn't even count. We also now have um, 80 homeless shelters where the city is funding primary care, behavioral health care, um, again, trying to meet people where they are to get them into care. Next slide. Um, and so the uh, we're going to skip number two and number four for the purposes of today. But in number three, we were also charged as a city to expand crisis prevention and response, especially for people with serious mental illness. So if you move ahead, uh, this brings us to care. Uh, the Crisis Assistance Response and Engagement Program. And the idea is that if somebody calls 911, it's an emergency. Uh, but if you have a, a behavioral health component to that, if really it's uh, especially a mental health issue or a substance uh, use issue, ideally, that person would be served by a mental health professional or a substance use professional. Um, and that person can get the care that they need much better than traditionally, if you called 911, the only two options that you had were to get a um, Chicago police officer or a Chicago fire department uh, response and paramedic. And those are critical and important, but when the primary issue is mental health, we think that there's so much more that we could be doing uh, to improve our city's um, 911 response. And so it's not just about when people call 911. Uh, we've done work pre-response. So for the first time in the city's history, there are now mental health professionals that are staffed in the city's 911 call center. So if folks are calling in, you can resolve over the phone instead of dispatching first responders. Um, that's important. But also we want to provide the mental health support to the 911 call takers, um, the dispatchers patchers, the response team. So that's been pre-response. And then now for the first time in the city's history, mental health professionals are being dispatched from the 911 call center to respond to behavioral health crisis calls that require an in-person response. And that will also be true in your businesses. If you are calling 911 and there's somebody who's seeming to have a primary mental health acute need of some kind, um, as this program continues to grow, it will be more and more likely that you will get a care team. And then finally, post response that residents um, after that 911 uh, moment, we have follow up that happens. Uh, we work to link these residents to appropriate community based services. For example, link them into our trauma informed centers of care, those mental health clinics that I show you. We're also piloting being able to, um, where folks are having a crisis, instead of just bringing to the, um, to the emergency room, can we bring them to a setting that can give more comprehensive care? I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Richardson uh, from the Chicago Department of Public Health, who really has been involved in the nuts and bolts of this program and the crisis response teams. Then I'll come back at the end. Thanks, Dr. Arawadi. So I'm going to talk in detail about what these teams look like, what they do, what it might be like if you all call 911 and get a care response. Um, so we have, as Dr. Arawadi was talking about, um, these healthcare-based teams, and they respond to 911 calls that are screened as having a mental health component. They offer a de-escalation, they can do on-site assessments and referrals. They also transport folks to alternate destinations. They'll transport to the emergency department if it's sort of non-emergently, they just need services at the hospital and they do that extensive follow-up. They do all of that in vans that look 
the blue and red vans like you see there on the right, um, which allow space in the back for the clinicians to meet with someone if they want to meet in the back of the van. They're also a trauma informed sort of transportation service for folks. And we have two, two types of teams that are doing this 911 response. We have alternate response teams that have two members on them, a CFD, a Chicago Fire Department paramedic, and a Chicago Department of Public Health mental health clinician. And then we have a second type of team, we call them multidisciplinary response teams. And those include the paramedic and the clinician. And we also have a Chicago Police Department CIT or crisis intervention trained officer for folks that are not so familiar with what CIT is, it is a sort of extra level of mental health training for police officers. And then the third type of team that we have is called the opioid response team. This is a team um, that does not do direct 911 response. What they're doing is follow up for uh, 911 calls that came in for opioid overdose. And they're doing this in a really geographically specific part of the city. And I'll show a map that kind of outlines all of this, but they're in the Garfield Park and Humboldt Park areas of the city. And they are taking EMS uh, data on folks who overdosed in the last day or two days and trying to go find them and conduct that that follow-up. That team includes a paramedic from the fire department and it also includes a peer recovery specialist. You see some of the folks pictured here out in January in Garfield Park. Um, a peer recovery specialist is a person who themselves have lived experience of substance use and overdose in some cases and have been um, certified to provide linkage and support services for other people who are um, struggling with substance use. And so the care program launched in September of 2021 over there on the far left of this uh, timeline. And we launched in two areas. We launched uh, in Uptown and Lakeview and in Auburn, Gresham and Chatham. And those were teams um, with the, the three person teams, the multidisciplinary response teams. So the paramedic, the clinician and the CIT police officer. And then in June of last year, we launched our first alternate response team. So again, that's the team that has the two, the paramedic and the clinician on the Southwest side. So that dark blue area on the map to the Southwest, Gage Park, uh, Chicago Lawn area. In January of this year, we launched our opioid response team, which is that light blue um, area on the map, again, East and West Garfield Park and Humboldt Park. And then we're very excited last month to have two really important expansions in our timeline of care. The first is that we did launch our second alternate response team in the downtown South Loop area. Uh, and so that is a team responding directly to 911 calls. And we also exp expanded the types of calls that these teams can respond to. So I said at the beginning, they're doing 911 responses where that call has been flagged as having a mental health component. But we have a lot of calls that come into the call center that are not sort of immediately labeled as mental health disturbance, mental health problem. They're labeled criminal trespass suspicious person, check well-being. And so what we've been able to do this year is expand the types of calls our teams can go to, to all those types of calls if they have a mental health component. So somebody, for example, trespassing in a store, but really they're trespassing because of a mental health uh, issue going on right in that moment, or, or they're trespassing to sort of um, try to, to steal some goods because they're hungry and, and there's sort of a mental health or behavioral health component to that. Our teams can now start going to those calls. Um, in that expansion, we also expanded down to serving folks 12 years through 65 years. We had been sort of in the 18 to 65 range. And then what I think is exciting, and this map sort of illustrates, is that moving into the summer and fall of 2023, we are uh, planning a lot more expansions. So we'll have two more teams going live, uh, one on the far north in that yellow um, district highlighted at the top of the map, and one in the far southeast. Uh, those teams uh, will go live kind of by the end of this summer, and those will be the 911 response teams. And then Dr. Arwadi will speak at the end of the presentation about two, I think, really important alternate destination um, sites that we will be setting up um, towards the end of 2023 for these teams to be able to actually transport folks to places that are not emergency departments or homeless shelters. So we publish data on this whole program. Uh, it's updated weekly and you can visit our dashboard shy.gov care 
it's linked there on the slide, um, to see a lot more data than what I'm presenting here, but just kind of high level to get a picture of what's been going on and, and how much how much these teams do. Um, this is a, a monthly graph of the number of 911 responses, and you see each sort of community area, each team that is serving is a different color. So we have our, our South Side Auburn Gresham team in light blue, dark blue is the uptown North Center Lakeview team. Um, as I showed you on the timeline, that alternate response team on the southwest side went live in June. So you see the red bars start in June of 2022. And then um, just last month, at the very end of the month, so it's just a little bit in March and then quite a lot so far in April, the team down in the in downtown South Loop area. And these numbers are the, the number of 911 responses that the teams respond to. Our teams work Monday through Friday right now, um, just about from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And so um, we sort of see fluctuating numbers of responses, but we have programmed to date had over or almost 750 uh, 911 responses by our teams, over 600 follow-up encounters and zero use of force or arrests. The other data that is presented on that dashboard um, is sort of what happens, and I'll walk through a little bit more detail, but what happens when a care team responds to a 911 call? Um, you see uh, they can provide services on site with no transport, no transfer to anybody else. They can also provide services and then maybe they need to call EMS because the person does need to go emergently to the hospital. So that's services and transfer. Um, they can provide services and then they themselves will transport someone. And we have done transports all over the city. There's no restrictions on where we can go and how we can get folks there. We've taken people to shelters, clinics, to the DMV. Um, so we are really there to and have the time to be able to bring people where they need to go. Um, about 29% of the time, and I think this is an important data point, we don't have contact with the individual in crisis. We respond to that 911 call, but often by the time we get there, there is nobody there. And this is actually um, common in emergency response, right? And so not something that we flagged as an as um, anomaly in the care program. Uh, and then sometimes when we arrive, the person doesn't want our help, doesn't want assistance. And so we have about 9% of the time, um, the individual in crisis refusing an assessment, refusing services. Um, and about 9% of the time, by the time the care program has arrived, um, a police or fire unit, um, for whatever reason, was already there and had already resolved the crisis. You'll see that um, on average, we are on scene for about for over an hour, for about 75 minutes, which I think is really a testament to um, when someone is in mental health crisis, you need time, right? You need space and you need time to deescalate and provide them with what they need, that trauma-informed harm reduction approach. Um, so 75 minutes is, it's wonderful that we have healthcare-based teams that can provide people in crisis with that much time of their day. Um, and it usually takes us under 15 minutes, about 12 minutes to get to the scene. We also have our follow-ups there. We do them by phone and in person. And a lot of folks need a whole lot of follow-up. So we are doing a lot of care management and case management after the crisis. So if you call 911 and it's an emergency with a mental health crisis, uh, you are in one of our catchment areas for the care team and they, they show up and they respond. What does it look like? Well, they will either show up alone or they might show up together with the police or perhaps there's a, a medical emergency as well. Maybe fire is on scene too. But what the care team will do is um, the mental health clinician will deescalate that person in crisis and they may conduct a brief needs assessment, which is a mental health assessment, but also asking them about their food, their housing, their clothing, their needs in that moment. We have a lot of clothing, hygiene items, food, gift cards, bus passes, things to give people. Uh, we will transport, if needed, to a hospital, non-emergently, emergently, to a crisis stabilization center, a shelter, a clinic, like I said, a, really any location. Um, we'll do a lot of referrals to treatment, to outpatient mental health, um, to help folks navigate housing is a big part of what our clinicians do, um, and support around things like employment and food access and signing up for um, food stamps and things like that. Our teams also do extensive work with family, friends, with staff or um, folks on scene of the, of the crisis to provide information and resources to help 
support people in crisis. And then we do, like we said, that really extensive follow-up at minimum at one, seven, and 30 days after that initial encounter to try to really interrupt um, the, the, the continual use of an emergency system and really get people preventive care and holistic care um, to prevent you know, another 911 call for the same person. Um, so here you have a, a picture of one of our paramedics, <laughs> shyly smiling in one of our vans. Um, and I wanted to share just a, a short story from, from one of our care encounters. I think it really illustrates the ways that our teams can support the other emergency systems in the city. So um, we had an individual experiencing homelessness and they started a fire to try to keep warm and that fire got out of control. The fire department was called and um, kind of immediately realized that there was a mental health component related to all of this and called the care team as an assist. Um, the individual was very willing to speak with our clinician on the van and really asked for help. And so after doing that initial assessment on scene, our care team transported that person to a community crisis stabilization center. The transport went really well. We find in transporting folks that that time on the van together, you develop a rapport and some trust. Um, they were taken to the stabilization center and that center was then able to get the person into a shelter. So the big question I always get when talking about care to the, to the community is, well, how do you access care? Well, care is fully through 911. This is a 911 emergency response program. Um, so you will call 911. The 911 call center will triage that call just like it triages every call to 911 in the city. Um, but for the care program, they were really looking for, is there a mental health component? And are there a certain um, safety indicators? If there's a presence of a weapon or really escalated violence, um, the care team might still be able to respond as an assisting unit, but it might not be the only unit going to the scene. After they do that triage, um, the, the care team will be sent. And the other way that the care team will get to calls is that um, CPD will go over the radio and request them, right? But that is still through the 911 system. And you see pictured here, a paramedic, a clinician in the center and a CIT officer on one of our teams on the north side walking in their district. So I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Arwadi to talk a little bit about a couple of really important initiatives in the, in the alternate destination space coming up. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, so just a couple more pieces to, to finalize in the presentation and then we're happy to take questions. So as we mentioned, when we're thinking about really improving the care for people who are having mental health emergencies, it's not just about the 911 call. Sarah talked about the follow-up that happens with individuals, uh, but also we know that people with complex behavioral health conditions, very often they are cycling between the jail, the emergency department, the street, the homeless shelter, um, and often are not really able to break out of that cycle. Um, and we want from both a sort of cost effectiveness and importantly from getting these folks uh, the health care that they need, we really want to try to break that cycle. So there's going to be two new initiatives starting um, hopefully later this year in the city of Chicago. Uh, already sort of planning and work is underway. The first is for the really the first time in city in city history, we're going to be standing up some uh, what we're calling health focused stabilization housing. So as you know, people who are experiencing homelessness, um, there's shelter options, there's there's various things in place. But what we see is that often people who really have serious um, unmet mental health needs and substance use needs or chronic medical conditions, sometimes they're actually not well enough um, to just be in even some of that supportive housing without more attention to health care. And so during COVID, the health department, you know, we had a hotel and we would have folks who were experiencing homelessness, but also had needs able to be temporarily housed, but also get on-site medical care. And so we are replicating that. The plan is for um, the cities planning to purchase uh, a motel um, and, and turn, you know, in a um, probably a 40 unit kind of way initially here, but to create some temporary housing that's single room. So it's not uh, for folks with, with mental health challenges. Often the shelters um, can be 
uh, challenging. Um, and so this will be single rooms, like in a motel, but that's been remade to make sure that healthcare is first and, and, and foremost. So um, there will be on site, both primary and behavioral health care. There will be intensive case management, social recovery services, really these trauma-informed community-centered wellness supports. And the idea is that, that folks will be able to stay up to about six months or so, uh, get their medical concerns, their mental health, their substance use, their chronic uh, health conditions, get those stabilized, and then be able to transition them more successfully, hopefully, to some of the supportive long-term housing. So brand new, huge lift for the health department in the city, uh, but we think really starting to meet some of these needs for the people who are just continuing to, to fall through the cracks. And then the other is we're planning to stand up um, a sobering center. A sobering center is something that's been done in other places around the country where um, right now if somebody is, is acutely intoxicated, uh, there's really not a lot of places for them to go besides jail or the emergency department. Um, and really often we want to get to a place where folks can sober up, but then get the services that they need. Uh, it helps take pressure off the criminal justice system. And importantly, it helps take pressure off the emergency departments. And so uh, this, the idea is this would be a 24 seven alternate destination for acutely intoxicated individuals who meet certain criteria. Um, again, we'd have a facility mobile van that could train transport patients, you know, from public settings or even from emergency departments, potentially to the sobering center. And there we would have on-site recovery coaches, basic medical care, behavioral health supports, get people into treatment if they're interested in that. Um, and so two really new approaches for Chicago for alternate destinations uh, to better to better meet needs. So we're excited about that um, as the care program continues to go. Next slide. So just to sort of um, finish up here, Sarah already told you um, that the way you access the care program is through 911. This is for emergencies, settings where you would regularly call 911. Um, as we said, right now, this is all in a pilot and continuing to grow. Care teams are currently dispatched Monday through Friday, 10, 10.30 to four. Um, our hope is down the line, that will be more time. Hopefully it will be across more of the city, but this is where we are right now. And so as a reminder, that's an emergency line. You get the ambulance, you get the police and or you get the care team uh, sent to emergency mental health care calls. And these are appropriate for calls that require immediate emergency in-person response. There's an individual in crisis at that moment. They have medical needs that require, or, or if they have medical needs that, requ that require attention as well as their mental health needs. You, you really want to make sure 911 is what you're calling. I wanted to highlight, though, you know, red is sort of emergency. Yellow, there's a new nationwide number um, that's 988. Uh, for many years, there's been a national suicide prevention lifeline, but it's sometimes been different phone numbers in different places. And just recognizing nationally um, that there are people who have mental health needs who may not want to call 911, but aren't sure who else to call. Uh, 988 has been stood up as a national number, and I think we will continue to see this grow. So this is a mental health crisis helpline, but at least right now, it is only a phone. It is not an in-person um, intervention. So the idea is you or any of your employees or your family members, you know, for people who are feeling like they're having more of a mental health crisis, they're thinking about suicide, for example, they're just needing help. You call, you get a trained call taker that can help de-escalate crises, can help get individuals connected to resources. Our hope is that eventually there will be some ability to send out, you know, lower acuity mobile crisis teams, but there's um, a lot that needs to happen before that. I, I would guess that's at least a year out. Um, uh, and so these are appropriate where someone really needs to talk to a trained professional. Uh, they don't have any immediate risk to self or others, and there's no need for an in-person response. And then finally, in green, I just wanted you to know, um, here in Chicago, the, uh, the NAMI, it's the National Alliance for Mental Illness, um, the helpline here is 833-626-4244. This is really a Chicago specific resource hub for everything related to mental health. So um, it's not an emergency line, but if folks are um, needing additional help um, with finding a mental health clinician or needing to talk shorter term uh, to someone about mental health challenges, general inquiries about local mental health, uh, this is really a good number. And the last thing I wanted to highlight is that this helpline, um, which has long been connected to sort of city services and funding, et cetera, it also is now connected 
connected to um, a new 211 uh, General Health and Human Services hotline. And this is actually the last slide that I have because this is a new thing that has been stood up for both Chicago and suburban Cook earlier this calendar year, but we find that a lot of people, you know, are still learning about it. All over the country, um, many of you are probably familiar with 311. You know, everybody knows 911 for the emergencies. Many folks are familiar with 311 uh, as the number that you call for city services. Uh, you know, there's a pothole, there's a um, uh, you know, some kind of emergency, there's a tree, there's city services is 311. But most of the country actually has had another number, has had this 211 number where people can call if they need help with health and human services, child care, employment, food assistance, health care, housing, legal, immigration, substance use, transportation, utilities assistance. The idea is this is not just city services. Yes, city services are in there, but more it's a one number that people can call with help for any of these things. So it's it's newly been stood up. It's Chicago, city of Chicago, um, it's Cook County, and then the United Way of Metro Chicago. And so you can call 211 to talk to a local navigator. You see, you can text zip codes. You can also go to 211metrochicago.org to search for it. And so the NAMI helpline, for example, has been connected to 211. So if somebody calls 211 and they're looking for that, they can get connected. Um, so this has been a, a lot of information. I think go to the last. Is this our last? slide, yes. Um, but appreciate your interest. We really want to make sure um, that the business community is aware of these kinds of, res of, these kinds of resources and um, uh, keep you up to date with what's going on, but also make sure you know that if you are calling 911 for a mental health emergency, you very well may get a care team um, and what that is about. Uh, and also just to make you aware of um, some of the other resources like 211 that are available to anybody, to your employees, um, to your family, uh, and we really appreciate um, everything that you do uh, to keep Chicago uh, healthy. And thank you for your attention. We are happy to answer questions. Do you have a question that you would like to personally ask? You can just raise your hand and I will unmute you. And I'm seeing the comments here um, from Arlene. Thank you. And uh, from Monique. and. Um, couple of information there. So thank you. Thank you for those comments in the chat too. Lauren, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, uh, this was great, guys. Thank you for the information. Just curious, what are the rollout plans for other communities and neighborhoods? I'm in Bronzeville um, and we have, um, I'm part of Urban Juncture Foundation, which runs Boxville. It's the outdoor shipping container marketplace. Um, here on 51st and Calumet. And so we very often, right, uh, ha particularly in the summer, have instances where, you know, businesses have interactions with folks that it's clear we don't want to call the police, right, because we know that this isn't um, necessarily a criminal issue, but that someone is, is in need of help. And so it sounds like it will be um, an ideal pairing. Um, so just curious of when other neighborhoods or communities would, would be able to benefit. Yeah, absolutely. I'll start with that. And Sarah, if you want to chime in. So first of all, the reason that we are in the communities that we are in is based on uh, data on where do we see 911 calls? Where do we see unmet mental health needs? Even the order in which we've gone them and the type of teams really has been based on that. So um, the, the current, you know, 2023 expansion plans for the loop, which is already looped and then far north and far south, that's based on where do we see the most unmet needs? Um, certainly we are, um, um, uh, very hopeful that this is a program that will uh, continue to expand. Um, we obviously are at a time of mayoral transition and so uh, have already been sharing about this program. It's not just a program, of course, of the health department. It's a program of the health department, the fire department, the Office of Emergency Management Co um, and Communication that does the 911, and then uh, where necessary, the police department. Um, and so we don't at this point, um, uh, I can't, say with certainty uh, where or when we would be going further. Um, but as the new mayoral administration comes in, I hope that they will agree that this is work that is important to continue to grow and invest in. Um, so what you're seeing on the map is what we have already publicly sort of committed and are hiring and planning toward. Um, but my hope is that there will be uh, further expansion. And Sarah, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. 
Yeah, I think that's right. And I would just say this has been a two year pilot program. So we are coming up on year end of year two, September 2023. Um, and we are being evaluated by the University of Chicago. And so around the end of our two year pilot period, we're also going to have a lot of data about what the effect of having these teams in these community areas means for people served by them, for 911 calls in those community areas. And I think those pilot learnings are really going to help us understand how we expand because this is a 911 program so it has to be citywide and it has to be 24 7 to really reflect what 911 means for people in chicago so i think that's where we're looking and um just sort of getting there as we can yeah and um I, just one other piece of context 911 is very highly regulated as you can imagine um and so any changes that we make um, to 911 response, uh, go through a, a big process, you know, with the state needing to kind of approve different types of responses and wanting to look at data to show that we can do this safely and effectively. And so it's also been sort of a, a real growth process over these last few years as we sort of show that we can do this part and we show that we can do this part and and we have some of that impact. So um, my 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 certain certainly my hope and expectation is that this will continue to grow. I'm seeing there's some more questions it looks like in the Q&A when I clicked on it too. So um, BACP do you want us to take some of those or? Um, you can take some of those as well. I'm seeing them okay. popping up in the Q&A okay. and the chat. Yeah, so right, they're kind of in both places. So I see Jeremy Wolf's question here. Is there any data on how many calls uh, should have been or could have been dispatched to care that were not? Is the 911 call center effective at routing relevant calls during the whole 10 to four Monday to Friday hours in all the included areas? Oh, I love this question, Jeremy. This is exactly the kind of thing uh, that we look at. Sarah, do you wanna just sort of talk very high level about some of that kind of evaluation work and a general sense of, of the, what's happening there? Yeah, this is a great question. So if we think about the 911 system uh, and the duration of the care program, for 50 plus years, the 911 call center had basically two options to dispatch when a 911 call came in. They could send police, I guess three options, right? Police, fire, or police and fire, right? And so in September of 2021, we introduced care and that meant they had to triage for these mental health calls and then make the decision of whether to send police, fire, or care, right? And so I think in the last year and a half, we have done so much work and the, the call center has done incredible amount of work to train hundreds and hundreds of call takers and dispatchers to be able to do that triage and effectively send the care program. And I think early on, we just weren't as good at it. And now we've gotten really pretty good at it, which is really an exciting thing to see in less than two years. Um, but I, I think that it's a great question because sort of thinking about operationalizing this type of program, that's exactly the thing that we work on every day is how do you get 500 people to make such a deep systemic change in how they do this work? Um, so I would say that right now we're in a really good place and the call center continues this like continual training and QA process all the time on these calls. Yeah, and I would add, you know, as we've seen an expansion in the number of call types, that has also been helpful because when we started, um, you know, the, the regulators, the state said, you know, we really want this just to be for, for uh, mental health disturbances, sort of things that get coded very clearly as mental health. But what we saw is that where um, the, t the regular 911 response was calling for care assist, Quite often, it was on calls that had come in, as Sarah said, for you know trespassing or suspicious person, you know some of these other indicators. And so every time you sort of make a change, um, it has to go across the entire dispatch system and some training. And so um, you know even now, the Office of Emergency Management and uh, Communication, the 911 folks have been doing another round of training. But every week, actually, the team looks at all of the data. Did we get all the calls we should have? Did we miss any? Uh, if so, what happened? And then we do some retraining. So there's been a lot of QA on that. Um, and uh, yeah, I think generally we are we are good at, at routing uh, calls um, overall. So I'm seeing comments, uh, Monique Prather. How can I help with this Overing Center? Love 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 that question. So not not quite live yet, uh, but there will be there will certainly be opportunities. So if you you know follow CDPH on social media, come to our website, you know reach out uh, as that becomes a reality. Um, certainly there there may be opportunities there, and we love folks um, who who have experience and want to. 
help. That's the, some of the best there. Um, Arlene Lemus is asking, is the CIT CPD? Please clarify. Um, so I'll start and Sarah chime in. Good question again. So um, CIT stands for uh, Crisis Intervention Training. Um, so these are, we'll sometimes say CIT trained Chicago Police Department officers. And CIT training is um, uh, sort of some, it's pretty intense training. Uh, it's extra training that officers get, not just in Chicago, but around the country um, to better be able to uh, protect, you know, health and safety and uh, de-escalation, et cetera, in mental health crises. So CIT does mean a police officer, but it means a police officer that has had some additional training in this space. That said, we still very much want the mental health clinician to be front and center. When there is a CPD officer who is part of the response team, they're still, they're going in the same van, they're part of the team, but their, their job is really to make sure um, that the scene is uh, secure if there's been, you know, concerns about a weapon, concerns about violence, uh, and to just make sure that both the individual, but also the clinicians who are responding, you know, their safety is safe, but they are not the ones leading the intervention. Um, it really uh, is first and foremost, even when a CIT um, CPD officer is there, uh, the intervention is very much led uh, by the mental health clinician and then the paramedic as necessary where there are other mental health pieces. Anything else to add to that, Sarah? No, yeah, I think that was, that's it. Okay. Um, and then I'm seeing uh, just people saying it's great to share with my coworkers. Arlene Lemus is asking how many care responder teams are in the field? So can you just maybe reiterate that again? Yes, I think it was on this side. So we have four teams that are doing this direct 911 response. And then a fifth team is doing the opioid overdose response, right? So we have the one team in Lakeview Uptown, one in the Loop, one in Auburn, Gresham, Chatham, one in a large part of the Southwest side, including Gage Park, Chicago Lawn. And then that fifth team is the Garfield Park opioid team. And then later this summer, two more teams, far North and, and far South. So we're in 17 community areas, I think right now, just to sort of give you a sense overall. Um, so yeah, and folks are wondering, will the video be available? Yes, definitely. Um, and then um, a question, is there a difference in duties for MDRT, so the multidisciplinary response team and the alternate response, please inform. So we sort of answered this, but why don't you uh, just kind of reinforce that piece again, Sarah? Yeah, good question. I think I didn't explain this thoroughly when I sort of first introduced why Chicago is doing these two models, right? So we know that when 911 calls come in to the 911 center and they have a mental health component, there's really a a wide range in calls. And we have a lot of calls that um, are what you might think of as like pretty secure, pretty safe. There's no, there's no weapon on scene. There's no other violence. There's no other indicators for a safety concern. Um, and we can send our teams without an officer to those calls. But we also wanna make sure that we get a clinician, a trained mental health crisis clinician to as many emergency mental health calls as possible. And so that is why we have these MDRT teams with the CIT police officer on them so that we can send those teams to calls that might have an unknown weapon or the presence of a weapon, or they might have someone who is um, threatening to hurt someone in the room or sort of an un, sort of the unknown safety indicators. We want to make sure we get a clinician there, but we want to do that safely for everyone involved. And so that is why we have sort of the two different models that we're piloting. And what I think is really great about the Chicago pilot is that we are doing that evaluation, right? So we are able to see in these different community areas how different compositions of teams are able to respond to different types of calls. And so hoping to be able to kind of present that data to the public and the stakeholder community to understand even more how different models are able to intervene along that continuum of mental health crisis. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, as we built this program, we we talked to people all over the country that are doing different sort of versions of this. And we heard very loud and clear um, that there is need for both of these. Because what you don't want to do is only have responses that have a mental health clinician when there is no safety concern of any kind. If there's not a safety concern, of course you want, you don't want to use police time on that. But what we heard from some communities that had only done an alternate response was that they couldn't have mental health professionals in, if there's a situation where there's a weapon involved, there is going to be a police officer. It's not a question of whether there will be a police officer. It's about 
can you still have a response led by a mental health clinician? And that's really sort of what we want. And so, you know, I think frankly, as 988, for those of you who are on, you know, rolls out more across the country, as we hopefully see at the state, there'll be some stabilized funding for some of that. Um, you know, we could end up in a situation where 988 down the line could be a, you know, I'm calling not just to get that over the phone help, but I'm calling in a way that I uh, don't think it's that acute, but I need an on site, you know, sort of alternate response. But at this point, um, the the idea is that the goal of both of these teams is to make sure that the response is led by health, is led by a mental health clinician and a paramedic. And that is absolutely true, regardless of the models. They travel in the same vans, they work on the same teams. Um, again, it's part of why we emphasize, you know, no arrest, no use of force. That is very much, it's not just about do people get mental health resources, it's about, um, you know, taking this work off the police as much as we possibly can. Like this, these are emergencies that should be responded to by health, but in Chicago and across the country for 50 years or not, they have only been responded to by police largely. And so it's a, it's a shift and it's one that CPD has really welcomed. Um, I want to be clear about, uh, but um, that's that's why we are doing both kinds as a pilot. And then that opioid piece too is, is another sort of different model here that we, again, looking across the country, what has had value. Um, and, and my hope, and again, I can't speak for the incoming Johnson administration and where things will go, but you know, down the line, um, you know, we've been very pleased with the initial pilots here um, as some of that evaluation data comes in. You know, I'd love to get to a point where this is, you know, routine. It's not just a pilot here and a pilot there, um, but it's, uh, you know, that's a that's a change in approach, and it's a uh, and it's a change in resources too. So I think that's that's kind of where we are. Um, and I see Veronica's question: If the evaluation shows that police response wasn't needed, what's CDPH's plan and commitment to implement non-police response response so we use re resources appropriately? So we're 100% committed to non-police response. Like, given the choice, you know it would all be non-police response. But if we only have non-police response, you don't have mental health clinicians, frankly, in the situations that are the most likely to go bad, right? Um, and, and I wanna make sure that even in settings that there might be a crime, there might be a gun, there might be, there has already been physical altercation of some kind, um, those are always going to get a police response. That's sort of not the question. What I want to do, and not I, what the whole care team wants to do, if we think there is a mental health component to this crisis, let's get that mental health component into that 911 response. So I don't at all see these as, as either or. I see them as two options, um, both of which you want to be able to have at different points. Wherever possible, you want to use the alternate response. You, of course, uh, uh, we want police focusing on the issues where there's crime and where there's weapons. But even in the times where there's crime and where there's weapons, I feel pretty strongly about making sure that where it's needed, mental health professionals can still be part of those responses. So I hope that that kind of helps you understand uh, where we are in this. Just going through. Looks like you got everything in the uh, chat box. <laughs> There's a question, how will this affect other businesses? So um, I don't know that it will affect other businesses except in terms of being able to bring, I don't know if, if you have a more specific question there, but um, if it's businesses that are calling 911, it broadens the resources that are available. Um, if you're talking about sort of businesses that might serve people with mental health needs, uh, there are way more mental health needs than there are uh, uh, organizations serving them. Um, and we have worked hard to build up, like I showed you right at the beginning of the presentation, that sort of safety net uh, mental health care system across Chicago. So, um, you know, we had almost 74,000 Chicagoans able to access no barrier mental health care last year. Um, and I hope that that also continues to grow. So I think um, I don't see any negative impact on businesses. You know what, you guys are the experts, so let me know. But I think it's just about additional resources where we know people who have unmet mental health needs, um, you know, 
they're your employees, they're your customers. Uh, and we want as a city to do everything that we can to get those needs met so that they can be productive employees and, you know, uh, good customers and clients um, of, of your businesses. Looks like something came in at 249, two questions. From Natalie Green in the area. Um, in the Q&A box. I see it. Um, so uh, yeah, Natalie's asking, this seems to be a really good program to help the mental health community, as well as to better prepare the police department to send correctly trained officers. It's a great pilot program, probably should be expanded even statewide. Uh, mental health is not restricted as to what communities affects. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, mental health is, is everybody's issue, like no doubt about it. Um, and especially where mental health overlaps um, with people who also have substance use disorders, experiencing homelessness, et cetera. Um, you know, those needs can really become front and center. But yes, we see mental health crises all across the city, to be very clear about that. Um, thank you. And yeah, you know, I some other things that have started here in Chicago in the public health space have, have been expanded statewide longer term. You know, my first goal is to sort of, you know, we'd love to get to a point that we're citywide. Um, but yes, I do think it's a it's 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 the way that we should be thinking, I think, as a country. Um, and I, I appreciate that. And then um a uh, question from Arlene, is there any on view portion to the service or only dispatch? Um, Sarah, do you know what that means on view? Yeah, <laughs> I love that we know the terminology. Yeah, yeah. so on view uh, in any first responder uh, space means that the, the response team is sort of navigating through their district and they see someone in crisis. And so there's no kind of 911 call first uh, or they might sort of at the same time be a 911 call but they see the person and respond. Yeah, we do sometimes have that. So some of those, let's see, whatever slide that was on. Um, a very small, small number. Um, of those 750 responses were on view. Um, and so that that does happen. Uh, we had the care team on view, a, a woman whose baby was um, like choking, right? So the paramedic on the team was able to assist with that. Um, so that, that does happen. And it does happen, I would say, for folks experiencing homelessness and other behavioral health conditions on, on the street or sort of outside of a business in some of our districts as well. We got some hands raised. Um, Jeremy, you can go ahead and talk. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Good. Um, so thank you so much for the, the presentation. I think this is a wonderful program and I also really enjoyed all the details and facts in it. Um, I'm coming from, um, I'm doing the entrepreneurial certificate program where I'm hearing you know, lots of different trainings uh, regarding business uh, for the city. And so this is just from the business point of view. Um, I will be a retail business owner uh, soon. I'm opening a retail business here, but I've also worked um, at Starbucks for many years in Atlanta, city similar problems um, at Chicago. And there's a lot of situations that come up um, that I just wanted to, to quickly go through a few examples. And these are issues that a lot of business owners talk about. And I was hoping that maybe you could respond to one or multiple of these about um, what the business owner should do in that situation, what they should say, what they could expect to hear from the 911 call center. Will they know, for example, are what unit is going to respond? Are they going to be told that? And and so here's a few situations. I'm going to paste some in the chat, but I'm also just going to say them real quick. Um, so we often have panhandling going on in the business or right in front. Um, we ha often have people who stay in the business for hours at a time or right in front. Uh, without purchasing something. They often lock themselves in the bathrooms for a long period of time. Um, often they're purchasing things with panhandled money. So that kind of, you know, we, we feel like we don't want to ask them to leave because they are, you know, buying something. And also, you know, we want the what's best for people, which, which often is, okay, maybe they need food. Um, often tents are set up very close to businesses, which, which we feel sometimes could discourage customers. At Starbucks, I had someone come in once and just punch um, punch a customer. I called, you know, we called 911 and they said, well, you either have to make a formal charge and they're gonna go to jail for 30 days or we're just not gonna press charges. And so I was like, well, isn't there something in the middle? And that's one of the reasons I'm excited for this program because I feel like it's a middle thing for that. Um, earlier last year, I called 911 because a man was sitting in the middle of Grand Avenue downtown. And that one said, okay, we're going to send you, we're going to call the, the fire department. And then I got the fire department. They said, oh, we don't respond to that. And then they hung up. 
And so there the man was with cars swerving around. And I feel like this might also be something like that. So just in terms of those situations or the common situations, uh, what kind of business, own, what should they do? Should they be calling 911? What should they say? What can they kind of expect with this program, especially if they don't know if they're in the pilot area or not, as most owners probably won't be aware of. Yeah, so re- really good examples. I think we actually had a separate, we did a briefing, I think, for Starbucks, didn't we, Sarah? You know, where there have been just uh, a number of, uh, we know that there are certain locations and businesses that have a lot of these sorts of situations. Um, so first of all, uh, and, and Sarah, I want you to chime in on, on some of these specifics, but just to kind of highlight this, but then also I just see a couple other questions. Um, you do not have to specifically request care. You do not have to know, is it operating today? Is it in my district? Is it anything? That is on uh, the dispatchers officially, right? To sort of do that triage and make it happen. That said, if even as you're calling, if you're like, I'm calling 911, this is the situation, this might be good for the care team, you are certainly empowered to say that it can help sort of trigger some of that, you know, even on the 911 side. So it is not at all a requirement that you ask for it. Uh, uh, the hope is that you would get it even if you don't ask for it exactly for some of those in between situations, um, sort of like, like you say. Um, and then Sarah, do you just want to chime in a little bit more on, on some of those like specific examples and, and questions? Yeah. Um, so in Chicago, which is somewhat unique to Chicago, although it exists in other places, our 911 call center has kind of two parts. And so what you're speaking to, Jeremy, about speaking first to police and then to fire is what will happen if you are calling 911 and you are trying to get the care team in the district. It will go through the police triage and they will send it to the fire side. The fire side, will, the fire call taker will ask you more or less the exact same questions and they will dispatch the care team or they will send it back to be dispatched to the police department. So I would say that you should call 911 if you feel um, unsafe, if you feel like you would call 911 in that case um, for for safety reasons or emergency reasons, right? We can't guarantee a care response. They might be down on another call, right? They might um, they might not be dispatched because uh, the, the call taker heard some indication of, of a safety concern, but they might show up as an, as an assist. Um, the other thing I can say is that if you are in A lot of the the concerns that you're raising, we hear from businesses in the districts that we're in. And so one component of our work is that we can do sort of a proactive outreach model, right? Where you have someone who you don't want to call 911 for. It also isn't really an acute emergency, right? Um, You can email, if you go to shy.gov slash care, um, it's on there, but the care program's email address, you can reach out to our senior director of crisis services, especially if you're in our districts. And we can arrange for the care team if they have time and are not responding to an emergency to kind of swing by. So that person in the tent or that person panhandling who you think might just need some clothing and someone to talk to and start to develop that rapport, that is an option for businesses in our districts if and when we have time and are not responding to emergencies. And we have done that. We've done that with Starbucks. Um, And we found, I think, that continued relationship building with someone can, with a clinician, a trained person can kind of support some of that need. So I'm not sure if that's fully responsive, but that's kind of the the approach right now. Yeah, and the last thing I'd say, thanks, Sarah, is that we've seen also, what which I've been really pleased to see as this program has gone on, um, more and more often uh, uh, police response themselves call for care, kind of as a backup, um, which is really what we want too, right? So even if it didn't, you know, like if you've got a situation of some kind and it's just, you know, it seems like it's got a mental health component. Maybe nobody realized that quite when they were calling, you know, the, the, um, the team on site has the ability and we are seeing them do this uh, because they like it too, because then they can sort of wrap up and go. And the care team, especially the alternate response care team, um, if there's not a safety concern can sort of take it over from there. So there's, we've really tried to have multiple ways that this team can kind of come into a situation. Um, and I think as a business owner, if you know about it, right, where, you know, the, the police who are responding should know about this, the fire department who is responding should know about this, uh, that it is also, you know, all they are doing in those districts is supporting on crises that have a mental health component. And so uh, the ability to kind of even in an after the fact kind of way or a follow up kind of way um, is something that that we're that we're focused on. And I think learning more about really every day that these teams continue to kind of grow. Okay, we have one more person whose hand is up. Go ahead.
Hello? We can hear you. Come here. Hi, sorry about that. Uh, I was just basically wondering who would be the contact people to uh, engage with in these pilot programs and how do these pilot programs uh, sort of plan on engaging with the organizations that have already been uh, doing this service for the last 10, 11 years uh, with or without getting paid, uh, starting up early from ceasefire all the way on down to the orgs that have been doing it in their respected neighborhoods, but really, uh, you know, yeah, so we've never ever had mental health professionals as part of 911 response. So certainly there are organizations, including some funded by the health department, that do outreach type of work, that uh, do care coordination. The thing that is different about this one is that it is 911. 911 is a city service, right? Uh, it's Chicago Police Department, Chicago Fire Department, Chicago Department of Public Health, Office of Emergency Management Coordination. So it's not really in competition in any way with those organizations. It's basically um, bringing resources into that highest acuity, the 911 calls. That said, we work a lot with folks across the spectrum here, especially where they are alternate destinations, or we are often referring clients into different programs, right? So just to sort of give you an example, um, if we're calling and, you know, somebody doesn't need to go to the emergency department, and, and but they need some more help, and so there's a program that has a 24-7, they're called living rooms. They're like spaces that are designed for more mental health support, but they're kind of drop-in. That's the kind of place we might like to transport somebody out of the 911 system. So all of those other organizations, um, playing critical, continue to play critical roles, but they serve more as places that this program, which is 911 specific, can kind of refer to as makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It, it seems like it's a bridge for a lot of the orgs to be able to use to help provide more accurate, detailed resources and services, as well as accommodate the city in the data documentation uh, so that the implementation can be used more uh, effectively. Because I know a lot of the extensive studies they've done in mental health becoming a big um, issue, you know, in our city and uh, our country. Finally, there's a lot more engagement going on we just want to make sure that a lot of the engagement also does occur with a lot of the organizations in the community. And it just doesn't become a citywide effort because the effort has been made by a lot of orgs. Yes, no, absolutely. And that's why, you know, the very first slides that we showed that were some of, you know, the fact that there's 177 organizations that will now sort of provide mental health care that's no barrier. Some of those are direct city clinics, but many of those are organizations that provide mental health care in different ways. And we've been working to kind of try to stitch some of that together. And so, you know, I, I when we talk to organizations, I don't think any, at least in my experience so far, they, they don't for they don't really perceive it as a challenge or a competition to what they're offering. It's sort of an augmentation, especially at a time of crisis. Um, and there, there are, there's so much mental health need, right, across this city yes. at all levels that that this, you know, I care, number four, for those who remember back, number four in terms of our, our four top priorities here, you know, is about this systems coordination. And I think that is what to me is, um, yeah, thanks, Sarah, um, is it's it's not the sexy part, but it's this part that in a lot of ways changes um, what is available to all Chicagoans in ways that feel seamless, uh, even when we don't have a seamless metal, you know, we certainly do not have a seamless care system, uh, health care, mental health care, anything. And so the work here, I think, of care is in that emergency piece. Let's make this be something that Again, you don't have to know that you need it. You don't have to ask for it by name, but it becomes available to bring mental health resources where it's needed. And then we transition from that emergency care, right, to sort of these other pieces. So I appreciate um, the, the, the question and the comments. So um, I think we are just about at time. Um, 
And I see folks commenting about, yep, yeah, my daughter works for one of those living rooms. Exactly. So, um, and because of COVID-19, everyone has been exposed to trauma. Really true. And, and, you know, the way we talk about mental health, we want to do it without stigma. We want to do it in a way that uh, mental health is health. Um, and we want to make sure that when this city is responding to health crises, it takes a health first approach. Uh, and that really is kind of the overriding uh, goal. So thank you to BACP. Thanks to all of you for joining really your excellent questions. Um, you can follow along on the website, etc. If you, you know, we update the data dashboard every week, we put information out um, as the program continues to expand. We're always interested in businesses, ideas and thoughts and feedback. So that email address right on the dashboard, we look at it every day. Um, in a non emergent way, it's a good way to communicate uh, with us and with our team. Um, so um, uh, I would like to leave my email in the comments. I would mm -hmm. love to engage furthermore with the pilot program and definitely like to see the expansion of it. I would furthermore also like to be a part of the expansion. However, I can as a mental health survivor, as a DV survivor, a GSW mm -hmm. survivor, as well as a victim's advocate who currently mm -hmm. plays the role of advocating for a lot of the individuals in the Uptown and Rogers Park community, as well as you know uh, a lot of other distressed neighborhoods. We engage very heavily with a lot of people and would definitely like to see the allocation of the resources uh, go to the right people that really need them. We can definitely direct you, uh, team members, including myself and others on the team, as well as on the call, to areas where these are needed so if there is a contact even of sorts other than the email, like a direct contact or a liaison that can kind of uh, create a collaboration or an effort to coordinate better communication amongst us, that would be amazing. Yeah, I would say first, and we, we neglected to say this, is that as this program is growing, we will also be hiring for it. So I'm not saying that's what you are necessarily yourself wanting, but where there are folks who have, who are, crisis mental health clinicians who are peer recovery workers in the substance use space, you know, CFD is recruiting community paramedics. Like, you know, we will be growing. I am very hopeful this program. And so, uh, you know, just, just, just as an aside, like if you know folks interested or with experience in this kind of work, um, I anticipate that we'll be hiring for it, but then more, you know, more indirectly, um, you know, Sarah, it, I mean, it's it, it just, it, you say which is the best contact because you know best, um, but that uh, I think this is going to be, you know, it is an ongoing longer conversation as we figure out what 988 looks like, you know, over the next couple of years. Uh, new mayoral administration means we'll hopefully be seeing some additional kind of growth and investment in this space. Um, and, uh, and as you know, there's lots to do to continue to make sure that we are as coordinated as we can be across everybody and all the programs, um, you know, for the people who call Chicago home. So, um, and it looks like, yeah, Sarah says she'll reach out uh, directly to you as well. Great. Thank you to the health department for today's presentation. Thank you to all of our attendees. If you are a part of the BACP Entrepreneur Certificate Program and would like to re receive credit for today's webinar, please send an email to bacpoutreach at cityofchicago.org. Again, that's bacpoutreach at cityofchicago.org. To learn more about our upcoming webinars, please visit chicago.gov forward slash business education. Thank you again, guys. Thank you.